today. We're going to talk about breaking down silos to build more functional organizations so that you'll raise more money. All right. I'm going to go over some quick, quick housekeeping is that the recording and the slides will be sent to you after this presentation. You probably will want it because I'm going to breeze over a lot of information. I could probably do an all day or two day event just talking about this but uh, I'm gonna condense it into this very short webinar. So we're gonna go very fast and you might want the recording and the slides. Um, questions will be answered at the very, very, very end, but you can use the chat tool if you'd like and the Q&A tool. I have my friend Tricia here who will um, um, be able to, uh, yeah, there she is. And she'll be able to try to help you out if, if she can. Um, if you find that you have interest in learning more about Market Smart, we'd love to talk to you anytime. Just go to our website at imarketsmart.com. Uh, if you decide to talk to a salesperson, we call them solutionists. It's never high pressure. It's only informative and educational. So um, don't worry. We will not um, pressure you to buy anything ever. All right. So hi, everybody, by the way. I'm Greg Warner. I'm the CEO and founder of Market Smart. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. I think i am got like 17,000, 18,000 connections now. Uh, I get a lot of requests every day, and I'm really happy for that and happy to engage with you. If you want to connect with me, please feel free to do so. If you don't know about my book, um, I wrote a book called Engagement Fundraising. That's a, uh, a, a, a phrase I came up with to encapsulate uh, the methodology that I invented for fundraising, and we give it away for free. So if you ever want a copy, uh, just let us know. Click on this link here, and you could get digital version, an audiobook version, or if you reach out to us, we'll send you a print version. Also, I invented the fundraising report card, which many of you may or may not know about. It's completely free. It's something I built for the sector to use at no cost whatsoever. There's no um, tricks or anything. It's just, it's a, it's a visualizer of your metrics. So if you need to provide your board with reports on quarterly results, uh, this is a very simple drag and drop tool that'll give you all your uh, charts, fundraising metrics that you need to present uh, in like a matter of seconds. So it's very powerful tool. And it's like, think of it at like Excel or Tableau on steroids, but just for free. And it does all the work for you. I also invented the DAF widget, which some of you may already know or be using. There are many folks who use this. It's, um, it's a widget that you put on, on your website to help people who have already donated money to a donor advised fund. It helps them uh, give in a frictionless way so that they are more likely to give more dollars from their DAF that they already donated and got a tax, uh, a tax benefit from, uh, but to your organization. Also, I developed with Dr. Russell James the E uh, course or the online court training course that's based on his latest uh, four books of research. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Market Smart, in case you didn't know, is a outsourced, done for you marketing team. We focus on major gift marketing not low dollar marketing. And we essentially deploy automated marketing systems that help you land more meetings with major donors when they're ready to talk about giving major gifts of assets. And this includes legacy gifts. So our company offers that kind of service with a system and technology that um, enables you to usually get more than 10 to one on your return on investment with us. We guarantee 10 to one or your money back and we've never had to give anybody their money back, not yet. So uh, it's been 10 years now. And uh, if you're interested in that, we'd be happy to talk to you to help you be the fundraiser you always wanted to be. All right, so having said all that, let's get into breaking down silos. Again, there's a lot of information that I'm going to be going over. I'm going to do it pretty fast. You'll get the slides and such. And um, it's all based on, or, or most of it is based on Dr. Russell James' research. 
If you don't know of Dr. Russell James yet, he is a world-class educator and researcher who's been published just about everywhere and quoted in all the major media. And most recently, I think it was last year, he was inducted into the NACGP Hall of Fame. He also has a PhD in consumer economics. He was a former director of planned giving and a president of a college in which he uh, completed two capital campaigns, built several free buildings and tripled. And Dr. James probably knows what he's talking about. Before I get into what, we, what I learned from him and that I'll present is um, I want to let you know that my company has based our uh, We've broken down the silos, I should say, by learning from Gino Wickman, who, so if you're a leader of an organization, a C-level board member, perhaps, you might really find use in this book called Traction, which I think is just absolutely fantastic. But the, the quintessential, the, the, the book on breaking down silos is from Patrick Lencioni, and it's called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And I'm going to touch on some of that, but nonprofits are just very different. Oh, and I, I should mention, okay, so if you don't believe me for credibility's sake, and you want to see what our former staff say about me and us and how functional we are, you can go to our glass door because that's anonymous postings and see what people say. Uh, there are one or two, as there always are, um, who are maybe lukewarm, but uh, most people give us like five stars and that, that, that way, hopefully you'll believe me <laughs> that I know what I'm talking about here. All right, so let's talk about breaking down silos. This is the agenda for today. We're going to try and understand the problem. I'm going to break it down. Uh, I'm going to give you a, a little sense of urgency with regard to why we need to fix the problem. And then I'll get into Dr. James's recommendations for how to fix the problem. After that, uh, I'm going to get into the assessment results. Many of you, thankfully, many of you took the assessment uh, when you signed up for this webinar. And we have some results from that that I'll show you. And um, you, we'll let you be the judge of, as to what you think about that, but I'll, I'll, I'll add some color commentary on that. So I hope you'll stay around to see the assessment results and the questions um, if people start asking questions and you know we'll save those for the end. All right. So why do silos exist in organizations? Okay, if you're here, it's probably because you have worked for an organization or currently work for an organization where silos exist. This is what I call a flying golf ball strategic concern, right? If any of you have met me in person, whenever I'm met with a challenge, I say, okay, this is a flying golf ball problem very complicated. It's always hard to hit golf balls when they're flying around, if any of you play golf. So um, you really got to lay the golf balls down, and then you can hit them. You can see them. You can deal with them. When they're flying at you and all around you, it's very hard to hit them. So um, at a high level, I'm going to lay down some golf balls, and I'll say at a high level, it all starts with leadership. And at the very end, I'll be telling you, if you've got a poor leader, that's probably not going to change unless the leader changes. So you might actually want to just look for another place to work. <laughs> uh, easier said than done. I know I I'm empathetic to that. But leadership creates bureaucracy and it inhibits a staff member's ability to aut autonomously do meaningful work. Now, those words, autonomously do meaningful work, are very important in th that I selected them from a 2022 study. Of course, you'll see links throughout this because um, I, I don't just want to spout these things. I want you to be able to research it on your own. But there's a big report that Microsoft finally came out with where they studied um, how to increase performance and uh, longevity, uh, reduce churn of their own staff. And what they found, to really just boil it down, you know, 100 pages of research down to this, is that people want the ability to work autonomously on meaningful projects. And when you have poor leadership and bureaucracy, that inhibits a staff's ability to do that. When they feel inhibited uh, from 
doing meaningful work, they reduce their energy level and their interest, and that creates disengagement. And that reduced interest uh, in collaborating with others especially creates the silos. Another way to look at this, let's lay down some different golf balls, is the fact that organizations, especially uh, nonprofits, have disparate teams, including low dollar oriented fundraisers, high dollar fundraisers, major gift officers, event staff, communications teams, program staff, volunteers, board members, so many disparate teams that have competing obje objectives. This also inhibits a staff member's ability to autonomously do meaningful work when the objectives are competing. And that creates friction and creates misunderstandings in relationships, which reduces energy and interest and then creates distrust, which eventually creates silos. Um, those are super high level ways of looking at it and pretty common for any kind of organization or business, private sector business. What I'm gonna lay down are three big golf balls though, that I've found that are very specific to the, um, the nonprofit sector. And they are, so this is like looking, moving the golf balls a totally different way, maybe even using a different club on these, but I break them down into that the, there's money involved in, in, in this, there's relationships, and then there's needs of the people involved in the relationships, whether that's uh, the or organization's administration or a donor or anybody else who supports the cause. This, these three golf balls make for uh, a lot of uh, challenges in the operational mechanisms that require functionality kind of like uh, grease in an engine in order to operate smoothly and perform optimally. So I'm going to cover those three and then we'll, um, we'll, we'll move on to the next uh, part of the agenda. So let's, let's talk about money first. The, the thing about our organizations in this sector is that most are focused on two kinds of fundraising. There's the low dollar gift fundraising, which is um, focused on cash. And then there's the major and legacy gift fundraising, which is focused on assets. And also, I mean, just to start it right off, there's, it's not quite balanced. In other words, more money is usually spent on low dollar cash oriented fundraising and solicitation efforts compared to uh, major gift fundraising. The, the low dollar versus high dollars, I mean, I'm, I'm going to break this down in terms of dollars, uh, or, or let's look at some metrics, I should say. And these come straight from our fundraising report card. So if you put your data into the fundraising report card, I said I give it away for free, but and there's no tricks or anything. But the catch is that then I use this data for the marketplace, for the market, the sector to understand what's going on. So that is the one caveat for putting your data in there. And then every year, twice a year, actually, we look at this, these, these data points to see what's going on in the sector. Um, the under $100 donors, okay, compared with over $5,000 donors. You're going you're gonna to see some interesting things here. So the average donation amount is only 25 bucks compared to almost 41,000. The retention rate for low dollar donors is less than half of that of the high dollar donors. And the lifetime value is exponentially smaller, only 45 bucks compared to 75,000, not including legacy gifts, of course. So this kind of creates a, a polarization, almost in a strain on an organization. And meanwhile, the most organizations are seeing that the, there's a reduction in the quantity or volume of low dollar givers. And, and maybe you're, you, it, it, they, I keep hearing this phrase, uh, donors down, dollars up. So it's like fewer donors in total, but more revenue is coming in. In fact, um, uh, nonprofit sector hit a, another record, uh, which wasn't so great when you account for inflation, but the it, sector as a whole has been raising more money than ever, but the number of donors keeps disappearing. In fact, what 
many used to say was an 80-20 rule or also known as the Pareto principle, you used to be that 20% uh, of your donors made up 80% of your revenue, but now it's actually 76% of your revenue comes from only 0.74% of your donors, according to the data. So that's less than 1% of your donors are supplying 76% of your revenue. If you don't believe me, you know, put your data into the fundraising report card, or you could just go to that page and click on benchmarks, and it'll show you um, uh, where we are as of today. This is from the end of last year. Uh, what we're seeing here is with, that, with people giving mostly assets over $5,000, it's less than 1% of a donor base, making up 76% of the revenue, and the under uh, $100 donors are about 70, oh, I guess it's 77% of your, yeah, I think I got that flipped around, of the donor base and only 5% of the revenue. So the other interesting thing about that is, 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 is uh, if you place a budget, um, a marketing budget, a fundraising budget, you're usually going to get a 10 to 1 or our customers even see upwards of 100 to 1 ROI from an emphasis on asset oriented giving compared with a two to one or at best I've heard sometimes a five to one ROI on low dollar giving. Now I know we, we need low dollar donors too, but uh, I'm just trying to lay out what, what kind of strain we're placing on the organization that can create uh, competing objectives which lead to silos. So add to this when you're talking about money that where is wealth stored? So Dr. James, in, in his most recent research, pointed out that most wealth is held in assets like stocks, bonds, retirement accounts, and such, compared to very little money is held in cash. And that makes perfect sense. I mean, we don't walk around with, uh, with, with, with stocks. We just we keep them in the accounts where they belong, and hopefully they appreciate. But the thing about this is that while it's easy for board members or leadership or others to think that a dollar is just a dollar and it doesn't matter where it comes from, I mean, dollars always equal, no matter where you get it from. The truth is that it's, it's, there's a, a big difference in how you get a dollar from cash versus how you get it from assets. And wealthy people especially think of dollars coming from assets as costing them a feeling, costing them less to give away. Of course, sometimes they may get um, tax benefits or they just get sort of a lottery effect, which is whereby when, when you come across money, you already you sell a business or something or sell your a warehouse, it's part of a business, you know, there's a lottery effect. And then all of a sudden giving away uh, $1 doesn't feel like really anything. In fact, $100,000 might feel not so tough. So there is a big difference when you're talking about money um, coming from assets. It's more painful and feels more painful to give money from cash than it does from assets. Another thing about wealthy people that's been changing, and this is not in, uh, from Dr. James, but I found this recently, is that most wealthy people don't know how to give their money away. And partly this is because wealthy, the, the old inherited dynastic type of wealthy philanthropist is kind of going away. There's fewer and fewer people, especially here in America, that are inheriting their wealth. Now this may change with this great uh, wealth transfer, but I kind of doubt it because um, there's so many, so many people in America who are self-made wealthy. This usually involves people, professionals, um, entrepreneurs especially, and people who come from other countries, immigrants, seem to be um, uh, very good <laughs> at coming from nothing and building something. So um, this research 
came from uh, the World Ultra Wealth Report and is just showing that there is a growth in um, the number of people who are self-made compared to the declining number of people who are more dynastic, if you will. Now, any of them though, need fundraisers to help them, especially um, they need a guide is really what I'm saying. They need a counselor because unlike philanthropists and dynasty types, they were taught at young ages how to give money away. They watched their parents and their grandparents act in philanthropic ways. But the entrepreneur, the, the immigrant success story and such, they spent most of their time uh, accumulating wealth and they didn't really have the parents or the, the, the community uh, around them that would teach them how to give money away and how to be philanthropic. So what happens is at a certain stage in life, they realize, wow, I've accumulated, now how do I give back? And they really desperately now more than ever need a fundraiser to um, counsel them on that because that's what fundraisers do every day. They help people, um, uh, they help facilitate the giving experience. So when you look at money, uh, that's that big golf ball. It's it, There's a, a, a big difference between cash giving and the organization, how it's set up to, to deal with cash giving versus assets. The solicitation level of difficulty for cash is much easier than that for assets, and the complexity level is much simpler. The uh, organizational planning tends to be quite tactical and less strategic. I know there's some strategy involved, but I'll tell you, raising of assets is a all strategy game. It's constantly thinking about donor needs and how to deliver value to individuals while the um, cash solicitations are, they don't really need to take each individual donor's life story and needs and how they wanna get value out of giving into account. They more so are thinking about the organization's needs, what program needs there are and societal needs. The uh, communication approach is gonna be very one way when it comes to gifts of cash, which is fairly uh, straightforward, but removed. And with assets, you gotta meet with people in a coffee shop or in their house, in, in their kitchen, where it's bilateral, it's reciprocal, which makes it messy and social. The level of trust required for giving assets is exponentially higher than what's needed for just uh, hitting a, a reply uh, or giving 50 bucks online. And the time focus of the organization is just generally going to be focused on immediate gratification, while it's more so about delayed gratification when it comes to asset giving. Um, the staff you required are, are for assets are uh, more like counselors and advisors, which are generally going to be higher cost. And um, the, the market for asset giving, I mean, the number of people is uh, possibly quite small. In fact, uh, like we just saw, it's 0.76, or, or you could go a little further out from that, maybe five even 10%, but uh, the people giving cash is, uh, 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 is actually shrinking. So I'll show you a stat on that in a minute. Nevertheless, the revenue potential for giving assets is much higher and growing, uh, especially because the wealthy are getting wealthier and you can get a much better return on investment from them. So next, uh, that's, that's about all I'm going to talk about money, at least so far. But next, I'm going to get into the relationships, which is can be very messy when you're dealing with more meaningful giving uh, as compared to the relationship that you need to have with more transactional giving. Now, this is Mark Knapp's relational development model, which I learned about when I was in college back in the late 80s. And um, it still stands the test of time that this is how relationships work. It's really pretty simple, is you come together and then you kind of maintain the relationship. Or if things change, then it stagnates and possibly even terminates. Now, in the transactional realm, it could be quite fleeting. You know, you get a letter, you make a donation, maybe you never hear from the organization 
and again, maybe you do. It's just pretty quick. Um, and since only did it say, I think 16, 17% of new donors um, end up giving again, I would say that it's a fairly fairly quick and smushed kind of relationship, while the more meaningful kind of giving of assets is generally going to be a long-term relationship. In fact, it'll take at least a year, maybe two or more, to close a substantial major gift. Uh, so if we break this down, you're looking at sort of getting money from charity for transactional giving compared with um, developing partnerships in support of philanthropy. This leads the organization uh, to who thinks transactionally or the team members who think transactionally to focus on money now uh, compared to retention, loyalty, lifetime value, and even after lifetime value uh, through legacy giving. So like I said, the relationships are either short term versus long term and even permanent, like if someone names something. Um, and then the marketing that you need for transactional giving is usually going to be mass mail, mass email, promotional, very solicitous, while what you really need for meaningful giving is more personalized and value oriented. It's an exchange of value. As Dr. James says, if you want a million dollar gift, you have to figure out what kind of value you can give to a donor in return that equals to them a million dollars. You know, so they'll they'll be willing to pay for that experience. The methods deployed are usually fairly solicitous uh, gimmicks and, and, and premiums and things like that compared to trust building and value delivery. The proximity of the staff is going to be arm's length and, and somewhat superficial, while for one-to-one, -one, uh, for, for meaningful giving, it's going to be more one-to-one -one and, and genuine. Uh, enduring and synergistic. Let's see. And then um, when it comes to the decision-making pace, it's going to be very fast in the transactional giving, which kind of gets people pumped up and excited because there's always a little bit of money coming in, keep the lights on, but it's much more challenging for meaningful gifts of assets because it's slow. It's highly considered. It's very deliberate because these are consequential phil philanthropic decisions. They are not trivial by any means. And what Dr. James says about these two differences is that uh, he calls the meaningful giving something that's evolutionarily stable. Uh, that's because we as humans are, uh, uh, we live in tribes, <laughs> so to speak, and tribes require relationships, strong bonds and trust in order to survive and continue on with our human uh, experience. It's so we've adapted and we've become this way on purpose because it helps us survive. And, um, and that's what he means by evolutionarily stable. So when you put these two and, and I see someone keeps raising their hand, I won't be answering questions right now, but I hope uh, Tricia there can answer whatever that is. If, if um, the person would please put it in, their, uh, in the chat, what their question is, or I'll answer questions at the end. Sorry. Um, okay, so this, this is creating conflict, right? And it, the conflict is often also between the organization's administration and the major donor, right? Because major donors want to give so that an organization will do something on their behalf. But organization, administrative people, program staff, volunteers, uh, really both the donors and the, the, all the other people, the organizational people want to be the heroes in their own life story. That's what we all want. We all want to be able to look at ourselves in the mirror at the end of our lives and say, I was a good person. I did good here. I, I helped others, right? But when it comes to helping sustain an organization for all time, or achieving uh, um, on a mission, that doesn't work so well uh, because having two heroes and, and really the gift officer's job is, is to support both and to help both. And that puts the, the gift officer in a very, very precarious position, which only fuels dysfunction. 
right? What happens then, according to Dr. James, is that fundraisers unfortunately get discredited and treated as others within their own organization. And the worst part is when they get scapegoated by leadership or the board for not having brought in enough money fast enough. They become, you know, the leaders may become impatient or they'll just, they'll blame the gift officers for the problems. But the truth is this is a team effort. And um, uh, uh, what, what the scapegoating effect really is, uh, is at the core of, uh, and everything else that I just talked about, the money relationships and, and the needs are uh, what really create these silos. That's my perspective on it. Uh, and so we're all here to learn, okay, well, if we've got these silos and now we've kind of got a little bit of understanding of why they exist, how do we, how do we, um, how do we add functionality? How do we add grease to the machine so that everybody is working together? Um, I'm going to get to that, but first I'm actually going to add some urgency to this about why we've got to fix the problem. So I don't want this to be all doom and gloom. Uh, I will get to the other other set, but I, I'm going to I'm just going to hit it hard here for a couple more minutes. Is that uh, and this is a term I came up with for the sector many years ago. Is that I have seen a slow and creeping change among donors' perspectives, and I call this fundraising climate change because it happens seemingly so slowly. Uh, the best evidence besides from my fundraising report card that I can see for this came from a fairly recent report from the Lilly School of Philanthropy at Indiana, where they found that from 2000 to 2018, we went in America from two thirds of people giving in America to only half now. And most of that decline happened after the Great Recession of, I guess it was 2008. So this is picking up pace. Uh, the, the amount that people are giving on average has been going down as well. Also, now these, these numbers come from my phone fundraising report card is that um, retention rates keep going down overall. This isn't just low dollar or high dollar. This is all, this is the average of all donors. Revenue retention, that's how much money you're keeping from current donors year to year is going down. Uh, first time donor retention down reactivated donor retention down, repeat donor retention, eh, mostly down. This is not good. This is not good. We cannot afford to be dysfunctional. We can't afford to have silos in the age of fundraising climate change. The reason I believe that this is happening besides, and I'm not gonna put all the blame on, on just um, institutional or organizational dysfunction, What's happening here is that there's a, 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 a depletion, a reduction of trust among society for nonprofits. So this came out of the same report is that um, older people, older than 30, um, are, are, we're seeing declines in trust. Same with um, uh, younger people. I, I think that this is because of the solicitous nature of what I call fun, uh, populist fundraising which is the interruptive and fairly annoying uh, type of solicitations that we send out and we, we get um, uh, for asking for low dollar donations. This is kind of a dinosaur and people don't like it. So the more we keep doing it, uh, although we may feel it's necessary, which I, I don't actually, I think there's other ways to go, but that's a whole other webinar. There, I think that this kind of uh, communications is generating distrust among nonprofits. So the Edelman Trust Barometer has more recent uh, data on this. And what they found is that it, there's been a, a, a big drop in trust uh, in nonprofits, NGOs, and especially among the informed public, which is generally going to be your higher dollar donor. In fact, the distrust has has grown so much that now it has surpassed um, trust in, in, in business. In other words, NGOs uh, are trusted less than private sector businesses for like the first time in, in this study, which is fairly disconcerting. Adding to this urgency, 
problem. Uh, the urgency of this problem is inflation. Many of you may have heard that the numbers came out today. Last month, it was uh, 8.6 year over year inflation, but uh, this month it's 9.1%. Uh, so inflation is, is kind of growing. Uh, also, just the other day, the US post office increased postage. They didn't do it at the inflation rate, but they did increase it by six and a half percent, which is sizable for any organization that depends on direct mail. Of course, printing prices are going up. It's hard to get envelopes. Staff salaries are increasing. And many are feeling that there's a recession that's looming, which if that happens, there will be unemployment and uh, that will affect how many low dollar give it, uh, donors will give. Yet, during recessions, the wealthy people pick up the pieces and they tend to make money. Um, they'll buy real estate for less and buy stocks for less and all that kind of stuff. So they'll become wealthier. All right, enough doom and gloom, right? Let's talk about how we can fix this problem. I'm going to start off by saying that you got to check your leadership. I alluded to this in the very beginning. It's I know it's easier said than done. And look, I wasn't always a business owner. For most of my life, I actually worked for other people. And it's not so easy to just change a job, right? But I do want to point out that you should be selecting your employer as much as humanly possible, at least in the, the way the job market still is right now, is that if your leadership doesn't have the right vision, a clear vision, and know how to get the right people in the right seats uh, so that there's less friction and more alignment, that's a big problem. I'll tell you that I have this acronym I invented for my company and my team. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of crass. I, I do this. I, I blame it on coming from New Jersey and right, being raised there. But, um, but I just say to people, look, I like to give my team a lot of crap. <laughs> so uh, that just breaks down into clarity. Got to give people clarity. Got to give them the resources to do the job. Be, let them make sure they're accountable and they're doing it, but then give them patience and a lot of praise. I, and this is a whole webinar in and of itself, but I just want to tell you that it's important to have the right leaders. It all emanates from the top. So check your leadership. And if you are in leadership here today, you know, check yourself, check yourself, <laughs> make sure that you're, you're working to build alignment. All right, so number two, you've got to, got to, got to, um, pay attention to the hero stories here. So to reduce uh, conflict and get rid of the dysfunction, one of the keys Dr. James says is that somebody's got to remove their cape, right? The gift officers don't try to be the heroes in the story usually. It's the administrator, the program staff, and I'm not, I'm not saying they don't do amazing work, but when it comes to shoring up your endowment or your, your finances, there can really only be one hero in a giving story. The philanthropy story is all about the donor. The programs and other things, the volunteer, that can come from other people. But this is, you've got to make sure that the organization, the administration, the CFO, the board members have to take off their cape and help the gift officer serve the major donors. This is, when you do this, if, if they take this approach, that will add functionality to the whole process. Number three is emphasizing collaboration. So once the cape is removed, administrators have to respect fundraisers and the donors, lay down the weapons, look at fundraisers as translators for donor needs, right? Uh, listen to what the, the gift officers are saying that the donors are interested in and let the fundraisers engage in sort of a negotiation and a balancing act. I know that we don't want these rulers as donors. We don't want this, this, this imbalance where donors are dictating what, what gets done and, and they just want to pay and make it happen. That's not right, but there should be a balance and we've got to allow fundraisers, collaborate with fundraisers to be the sort of negotiators, the balancers and the translators of donor needs. Because in the end, if fundraisers can deliver donor value, donors will give. 
and they'll give more in return for more value. They're also rather, um, they're rather objective, like they will listen to understand why uh, you can't do this or you can't do that. All right, so next is um, taking what Dr. James says, he calls it a federalist approach. So as we're learning with the Supreme Court most recently, like we do have a balanced government. We don't often think of it that way because we don't we 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 listen to um, the president more and uh, Congress more, but it is three equal but separate branches of government, and that's federalism. Uh, not trying to give you all a civics course here, but you know that's the way the country's made up. The what Dr. James says is if you take a federalist approach whereby donors maintain power and administrators maintain authority, then adding to the mix, the, the balancing is, is helping to make sure that fundraisers are included and appreciated, not discredited or treated as others. Let them do their role. So he includes this in some of his research. I'm not gonna read all this, but I'm just gonna show you that he's got it all broken down as to how we might wanna balance this. And this, I'll be talking about this in just a second. But um, the last thing that you wanna do is you've gotta understand that the transactional and activity-based metrics that are often thought of and, and, and used for major gift fundraising and gift officers don't work. Okay, it's more about pipeline size. In other words, how many donors do they have in the pipeline who are considering giving uh, assets? And what's the value of those gifts of assets? What's the velocity of them moving through the pipeline? Because they could take years to happen. And what is the value, whoops, value delivery metrics? In other words, are you delivering value to the donors? These are different kinds of metrics. And instead of using unrealistic and arbitrary goals, like I've heard so many times board members will say, you know, we, we want you to raise 10% more. Well, why? Like, we don't know why, it's just because. I mean, that's arbitrary and that doesn't help. <laughs> uh, if vanity metrics don't help either. Like nobody cares about open rates or click rates when it comes to asset giving. If you get Elon Musk and Oprah, Oprah Winfrey and Bill Gates to click on your email and all 10,000 other emails don't get clicks. I don't think any of us will complain that those three are the only clicks. It's, a, it's about quality, not quantity. And finally, we wanna eliminate scapegoating of fundraisers. This is a team effort. If they're failing, everybody's failing. Everybody needs to be part of the value delivery machine in, uh, in, in order to uh, help major donors realize the value they can gain so that they give massive amounts of money. So these are the five keys to fixing the problem. Um, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Market Smarts webinars. I'm gonna get into the assessment results and then take questions, which I, I can see there are quite a number here. But first I wanna tell you that all of this can be found in our Donor Story Epic Fundraising eCourse, which is something that I developed with Dr. Russell James I mentioned earlier. It is uh, the only fundraising training course that helps fundraisers improve their skills so they can raise more major gifts of assets, but also help staff to work collaboratively. So you break down silos and work together to deliver value to major donors. Uh, remember all the uh, accolades I, I impressed upon you about Dr. James. This is all developed by Dr. James. And what he includes in this content of this online training course is what you should say and do to major donor prospects, why what he recommends works. And this is all based on research, not hearsay or orthodoxies and myths. Um, and, and, and how you can get everybody in, on the same page and growing in the, sec, in, in the same direction to be able to help with these sector-wide challenges. In the end, what you'll find out is what really works not what just some consultant said that they that, that you should do, but what really works based on all of his research, uh, you'll be able to face the internal friction and silos and break down the misunderstandings. You'll actually help retain staff 
and it's all in the donor story, Epic Fundraising online training course. The way it works, okay, is a low annual subscription for an organization. It's not per person and it's, you get unlimited number of students. That means you can bring on new employees and train them with this course uh, right as they come on, board members too, volunteers, and of course, anybody else, whether they're in communications or administration, even your CFO. Uh, here's one nice little testimonial from Cindy saying that this has been really helpful and she uses the conversations and she's a market smart customer. I know she does so that everybody in her organization is building functionality uh, and breaking down those silos. In this course, you'll learn how to properly identify and engage the top 13% of supporters that Dr. James says provide 88% of the revenue. That's very different from the 76% that we find coming from only half, uh, I'm sorry, three quarters of 1% of the donors, but he expanded it out to the 13%. Um, You'll ensure that most of your gifts actually come without restrictions. He'll teach how, how you can do that. You'll improve performance by leaps and bounds, but without working harder. In fact, you might even work less. <laughs> you'll figure out how to find the outliers that are sort of hiding in your donor base. And you'll understand what words really work. If any of you know Dr. James, he studies words and he tests them to figure out what words and phrases and sentences really work. So this is all to help you build a culture of philanthropy internally so your team raises more money as a, as, 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 as a team. That's what a team is. So this is the research theory, practical application. It's for both major gifts and legacy gifts. But actually, when you put this into practice, all levels of giving will increase. It is, in fact, a very new way of thinking in this course. It is innovative and new, and, and to me, it was just awe-inspiring and groundbreaking. So at this point, you probably want to consider, would this be beneficial to you and your team? You, what, what's included in this is uh, quite a bit. There's a complete course of 105 lessons. There's a read-along transcript, which makes it easy as the video is playing, and you can also download audio for your car or when you're working out. There is an online community that you can engage with, make new friends, but also get questions answered on a discussion board. There are monthly live Q&A sessions. These, um, these are, are called now mastermind mixers. And I have to say, uh, this is almost the best part of the whole darn thing is because we come together once a month and we, we chat and we break, go into breakout groups and we just help one another. And I know that uh, at least Jill here has said that she feels so privileged to be able to participate in these. There's also quizzes and worksheets from Dr. James to help you get the most out of it. And the course will get you 20 and a half CFRE credits or points, uh, along with you'll get study sheets. These are kind of like Cliff's notes, if anyone remembers those. Now, if this all seems really overwhelming, you should know that there is a fast track that only takes about the length of one good movie to get through. They're 19 bite-sized, fun and engaging, super brief, like five, eight minute, 12 minute sometimes videos. They're, and it's really well designed. It kind of looks clean, easy to get through. For the fast track, there's lots of cartoons. Hope it's not too sophomoric for, for, for anyone, but it's very easy to understand. And then for the deep dive, if you want all of the other 108, I think it was, uh, training sessions, some people really, really, really enjoy Dr. James's, but you can get through the highlight reel with the fast track. And these are Dr. James's slides. They're always kind of a little funny. Um, so you get all that. And uh, as, as Julie says, another market smart customer beats the heck out of getting another degree. Um, you get also a bonus of words that work from Dr. James. These are the phrases that encourage fun, uh, uh, plan giving. And also his 50-minute uh, training on how to raise major gifts of assets in the aftermath of COVID. And finally, you also get my bonus on how to land meetings with major donors. Um, all three is valued at $641, but uh, and I'm going to get to the price. I just want you to know there's a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, we'll give you your money back. No problem. No questions asked. 
And all of that is valued at $3,638 per person. But first of all, we, we knocked down the price substantially uh, throughout the year for 1997, but we decided not to make it per person. It's gonna be organization wide. So if you subscribe, it's for the entire organization and anybody can, can use it for that one price. So it is an annual subscription. But if you pay just $25 more, then the next five people can get CFRE credits, but then actually we reduce the price It'll be $9.99 right now. That's only until uh, July 19th so that you can get it. I guess it's basically like a half off that, that regular price. This is because we're just doing two registration periods a year at this discount. We're trying to get everybody in so that they start the course at the same time and it makes the mastermind mixers that much better. So the price right now is reduced to $9.99. It's an annual subscription. Everybody in your organization can take the course. If you add 25 bucks, five more people can get the CFRE credits. So that brings it to a total of just $1,024 to uh, get unlimited access. If you put 100 people on the course, then I guess that's 10 bucks each. You know? uh, that offer ends on July 19th at 3 p.m. sharp Eastern time. So last thing is, this is the way it works. It's $9.99 per year. You can lock in that subscription rate. Then you can add five coworkers to get the CFRE credits at 25 bucks. And once you do that, then it unlocks everything, all the unlimited number for everybody else. That's the total of $1,024 with a money back guarantee. So I highly recommend you lock that in now. If you forget and don't do it right now, you can always go back to our website and just click on the e-course there, but only until the 19th. And um, all right, so that's that. Uh, with the, the remaining time, I'm gonna get into the assessment results for all of you who took the assessment. Thank you for doing that. And then I'll get into your questions. So thanks so much for your patience if you already posted a question. All right, so we were trying to determine how functional people were. And this is not exactly scientific. And actually, Dr. James, just before he we went off on like a three-week vacation to uh, Europe, he sent me tweaks and changes to these kinds of assessment questions. But we'll probably get into that next year because, well, you already all took these, these assessments. So we'll be working on tweaking the, the assessment going forward uh, with Dr. James, of course. So what the, the first question, I think if we did this in order was asking if all teams in your organization are um, recognizing and agreeing that providing value to supporters is essential for building trustful, trusting relationships. And that was kind of the typical bell curve. I was kind of disappointed to see that it wasn't leaning even further down, you know, to mostly people saying pretty much true and absolutely true. So I guess I'm not that surprised, but I am a little disappointed. Um, the next one hit me hard and that all teams have a clear understanding of the process each donor goes through as they consider making, whoops, consequential major gifts of assets. So if most of the money comes from major gifts of assets, it seems to me that most people in the organization should at least have a general understanding of that so that they can help support the process so the, the organization generates more money. Um, I mean, program staff in, in included because they come back with amazing stories that fundraisers will use to help inspire giving. So it's a little bit disappointing to see that. Um, all teams understand and accept the fact that most donor dollars come from major gifts of assets and large legacy gifts. Those are the outliers. So this really answers the question of why the last slide was so heavily tilted. It's the fact that uh, most people apparently don't realize that most of the money comes from major gifts of assets. It's clear in this. Um, all teams adhere to a collaborative approach that involves separate but equal power. This is that federalist approach. And as a result, input from fundraisers and donors is accepted with the same weight as input from administrators and other insiders. Unfortunately, uh, heavily weighted like the traditional bell curve, not enough people saying that that's absolutely true. 
And uh, I think there's oh, what, two more. All teams recognize and agree that a fundraiser's job involves operating as a champion for and provider of donor value, as well as translator for donor needs. And it seems like we're just stuck on that bell curve where there's some organizations that really, really are saying absolutely true and they get it, but most uh, have a little bit of work to, to, to go in this regard. Lastly, all teams work together to make sure fundraisers are not discredited or treated as others, and rather are supported, heard, and collaborated with in relation to donor needs and the provision of value by the organization to the donor. So yeah, same old, same old curve here. Uh, looks like we, we do have some work to go. Oh yeah, yeah, whoops, sorry, there's one more. All teams work together to report back to donors. So they continue to recognize the value they gained through their philanthropic com contributions. That one, I think really would be, we, we should focus on, I, I would hope that everybody would understand uh, the value of reporting back in such that it increases retention and the lifetime value of donors. All right, so this uh, essentially concludes this episode for us and, and I'm gonna get into uh, the questions now. Let's see, I'll start in the Q&A area. Is there any correlation between trust decreasing and political gift scams? Wow, this is probably, I, I would say yes. I think scams in general, uh, spam, scams. You know, I know my mother-in-law sadly was the victim of, uh, of, of, of a scam and that created a, a terrible hassle for the whole family. So, you know, it, it is, I mean, trust depletion in any kind of financial transaction is going to make people concerned about whether they want to donate money. So I would say that that is contributing to a degree. However, um, political fundraising doesn't happen all the time. Uh, while um, or, uh, charitable and uh, uh, fundraising in our sector outside of political is happening all the time. So generally fundraising picks up around, uh, you know, every two years really. All right, so Ruth, let's get into Ruth. I mentioned that traditional intrusive marketing techniques have created mistrust. Does he believe nonprofits should stop all direct mail appeal marketing approaches? If so, what should take the place? That's a great question, Ruth. Okay, so I have written on this and I was preparing a book. I'll give you the short story because I have three more books already written that I haven't actually pushed out <laughs> and I got to get to them. But yes, I believe that actually any organization can raise more money through, uh, through tossing out all of the solicitous acquisition strategies and instead creating what the private sector has done is a more content oriented and engagement oriented acquisition model that does not require an entry fee from any individual in order to be part of it. In other words, I gave an idea to an organization that helps to clean rivers. I said to them, why don't you build an app that shows your members or donors, your supporters, your Facebook likes, your friends, where the cleanest rivers are and when a river becomes contaminated or when there's an issue with a river. So if they're going fishing or hiking or something, they can sign up for that app. They always know where the best rivers are and when there are problems with rivers so they can take action and advocacy and so on and so forth. So I could come up with a hundred ideas like that, but through an app that delivers value or some kind of content or engagement oriented value proposition, you can acquire people and build trust at the same time instead of only saying to them essentially, like, we want you to be our friend, but you have to give us money now. And it's urgent. And if you don't, we're gonna go out of business, so to speak. So I, I, I could do a day's worth of discussion on that, Ruth, but I hope, uh, I, I do believe that you, we pretty much could get rid of all low dollar solicitation techniques and probably be just fine. If we replace them with value oriented efforts. All right, so Jesse, uh, can you talk about how foundational support factors 
factors in. Okay, so that is a tricky question because foundations generally start as individual donors. Um, yes, you're welcome, Ruth. I'm, uh, uh, happy to talk to you about individually as well. I have a million ideas exploding about that. Okay, so when it comes to foundations, I mean, foundations originally were individual donors. And in fact, you're found any foundation, including a donor advised foundation, Jesse, is your ultimate competitor. Okay, so if you, uh, I know that we all want grants from foundations, and, and that is something that you should be working on. But ultimately, we would all be better off if people didn't feel the need to create foundations, I believe. I mean, foundations only have to give out 5% each year. Uh, often there's nepotism involved. It creates jobs for family members and such. I mean, people generally give to foundations or donor advised funds because they have not felt that they have enough trust or an enduring partnership and relationship with a cause and its staff to be able to place their money in the hands of those leaders and those fundraisers and organizations. So instead they create a foundation, they give to a, someone else's foundation or they create their own donor advised fund. So I'm not sure if this is the answer that you are exactly looking for, but I, 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 you asked, how does it factor in? Uh, that's, 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 that's my factor, uh, or that's my answer. I, I hope that was helpful. It looks like there's more questions, in fact, in the chat tool, perhaps. So I'm going to go over there and uh, start from the bottom, just making sure, yes, is this all based on US data? Insights Re Canada. So when we're talking about the fundraising report card, that is including Canada, because that's where some of the data comes from. Uh, there are a few outliers of, out of like 10,000, actually, I think it's 14,000 organizations, but it's not, um, it's very, very few outliers from other countries. It's mostly the US really, and a few from Canada. So hopefully that's helpful. I don't know about Indiana's uh, report. I, I have to assume that that's just the US. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, thank you for saying thank you. Uh, let's see, I'm just gonna scan here, see if there's any uh, other questions. Apologize if, uh, for the dead air here. I think that might be almost everything. Um, chart is a little small, sorry about that. Uh, we will send you the, um, the um, slides in the recording though. Yeah, there's the question about US data. Uh, okay, um, I think this, that, that covers all the questions here. There's just one new message, uh, no more questions. So thank you very much, everybody. I apologize, it came out four minutes ahead. Um, maybe I should have answered less questions, but <laughs> so it's a pleasure to have you all here. I hope you got some value out of that. If you have questions about the e-course with Dr. James, we're happy to answer those for you. And I hope to see you in the mastermind mixers, which I usually lead. So if you engage in those, we'll make new friends. I'll introduce you to the tribe of engagement fundraisers that are not all market smart customers. That's fine. You don't have to be a market smart customer. And Deborah, thank you. I will have fun with my new puppy. <laughs> all right, everybody. Thank you very much. Have a great afternoon. Keep cool. Enjoy your summer. Bye-bye.